Okay, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Gloria and I'm from Mission Society Singapore. I'm the vice chair of the education committee. So today we have uh, <clears throat> we're privileged to have Ian, who uh, is actually a, a postgrad student at the NUS, who is conducting research on the ecology of carnivore species and the potential for rewilding in Singapore. So Ian used to work at the Nikonchian Natural History Museum as an assistant curator of members. And he was also involved in fauna surveys using remote cameras with NSS and MNS, Malayan Nature Society. Okay, but Ian has uh, conducted, uh, has contributed articles for Nature Watch and the Malayan Nature Journal. So Ian is actually very passionate about uh, leopards and uh, he actually has Facebook groups on uh, black panthers and leopards. Okay, so without further ado, uh, okay, essentially Ding Li and I will be hosting this talk. So um, uh, can you, uh, if you have any questions along the way, please type it in the chat group. We'll take questions at the end. Okay, thank you. Ian, please. Thanks, Gloria, for the introduction. Just let me share my screen. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and um, welcome to my talk titled Black Panthers Are Not From Wakanda, Unraveling the Mystery of the Malayan Leopard. I'm guessing most people are familiar with the superhero character of the Black Panther. But in case you don't know where is Wakanda, it is a fictitious place located somewhere in East Africa where this character is from. Over on the right is the poster of the movie released in 2018 where the African continent is depicted. But are there really Black Panthers in real life in Africa? Well, this paper documents a famous sighting back in 2019, where a series of nighttime images of an individual was beautifully captured in Kenya, which is in East Africa. However, Black Panthers are extremely rare in Africa, and so associating Black Panthers with Africa is quite misleading. In this talk, I will show where most Black Panthers are found in the world, and try to explain why this is so. So here's the outline of my talk for today, very briefly. Um, I'll start with um, defining what Black Panthers are, and then I'll talk about melanism in wildcats, followed by leopards, uh, the taxonomy, the distribution and their ecology, and then the Black Leopards of Malay Peninsula, which is the topic of uh, today's talk. And I'll end by saying something about conflict and conservation in Malaysia today. So what is a black panther? The word panther is from the Latin word panthera, which was the name given to leopards and is synonymous. On the right, I've extracted from a 19th century natural history book in 1896. And you can see that the leopard is called the panther as well. And there's actually, a, interestingly, a confusion between the two terms. And they were thought to be two different species the panther being a bigger version of the leopard. But of course today, we know that they are, there's, a, there's only one leopard species and they are the same. But today, uh, people don't really use the word panther to refer to leopards anymore. Um, and it can also refer to the puma or puma concolor, uh, also known as modern lions or cougars, and which are only found in the Americas. And the only black puma is, of course, the logo for the puma sports brand. And what about black panthers? So, owing to a similarity in appearance, black panthers uh, today uh, can refer to either one, jaguars that are black, or black leopards, which I think, strictly speaking, uh, are closer to the correct answer because jaguars uh, are not actually panthers. As uh, I mentioned previously, panthers were the name given to leopards. So you can see from these uh, photographs that, um, I mean, to the untrained eye, right, they look very similar. But um, maybe some of you will know that um, jaguars are, are quite different animals from leopards in terms of uh, even the appearance. I mean, you can see that they are bulkier in size, um, 
stockier, the head the head is rounder than a leopard. Sorry about that. Let me go back to slides. Now I will. So as you can see, the coat patterns are still present um, under a certain angle of light, and this is called ghost spotting. So under a strong light, you can, like the picture on the left, you can see the rosettes of the leopard uh, are still visible, even though this is a melanistic individual. And interestingly, recently um, it was discovered that under infrared um, light or illumination, from um, camera traps, uh, researchers were able to um, discern the patterns underlying the, the coat of the Black Panthers. And this is uh, very important because um, they can be used to identify individual uh, leopards or individual panthers. And this was previously not possible. So this was uh, something of a break through in uh, I think it was 2013 when the, the, leopard, uh, the paper was released. Um, as you can see the title here, Melanistic Leopards Reveal Their Spots. And this was a study done in uh, Malaysia. And what they did was they, uh, they set the cameras to only um, shoot under infrared conditions. And this allowed the leopards to be identified to the individual level. And Using um, statistical software, um, they were then able to estimate the population density of uh, black panthers in this uh, forest in uh, Malaysia. So previously, um, it was uh, unknown um, as to how many um, le uh, black leopards there are because they simply cannot uh, do the estimation. So this is a very uh, a great um, breakthrough for them. Now I will talk about melanism in wild cats in general. And as you may already uh, have guessed, it is a condition of excessive production of the dark melanin pigments. And this is a phenomenon that can be found in many animals, and including ourselves. And we are darker uh, races and darker individuals, obviously. Um, and melanism in um, wild cats or even animals in general usually is, is associated with warm tropical climates and especially uh, under equatorial rainforest conditions. Um, and why this is so, uh, I, will, I will expand upon this uh, later. And melanism in wild cats is currently is documented in 13 out of uh, 37. Uh, wildcat species in the world, so um, about a third, and um, it's not actually uh, results in a separate and distinct species just because they're black, but it's just considered a different moth. Um, and the pictures below, you can see some examples of um, the smaller cats, um, other than uh, jaguars and leopards, which we've seen previously. Um, so. The wildcats here, um, most of them um, live in uh, rainforests, um, except for the serval, which is found in the in African uh, savanna. But uh, black individuals uh, have been seen, and they are usually uh, from the uh, denser vegetation areas. And there's even uh, many breeds of black cats. Uh, well, not many, but uh, there are some breeds of black cats, purebreds, and this is the one example, the Bombay cat, which uh, is a, quite a famous, uh, completely black uh, breed of domestic cat. How is melanism inherited from one generation to the next? There are two types of transmission. The first is when the gene for melanism is dominant. This is when the presence of the dominant allele or gene type results in melanism in the in individual. In this diagram, the parents are represented by the top row and the left column. 
One of them has the dominant capital B gene for melanism. And just the presence of this one gene is sufficient for melanism to occur under the various combinations in the second and third rows. This form of inheritance is seen in jaguars and jungle cats. And since non-melanistic parents do not have the dominant black gene, their offspring can never be melanistic. The second type of transmission is through recessive alleles of the melanism gene. Here it requires the presence of two genes for melanism in order for the trait to be manifested. As shown in the diagram, neither of the parents are melanistic as each has only one copy of the recessive uh, lowercase b gene. But if their offspring inherits one recessive b gene from each parent, um, as seen in the lower right corner, uh, it will result in melanism due to the double recessive genes. So besides leopards, domestic cats and Asian golden cats are also known to have such a form of melanism inheritance. And you will notice that both parents need to have the gene for melanism and that black cups can be produced by non-melanistic parents. So where can black panthers be found in the world? So from this um, two diagrams, you can see uh, black jaguars, which consists of about 10% of the total jaguar population. And they, these are represented by the red circles in the map. And as I mentioned before, uh, jaguars are only found in the uh, New World in Central and South America. So you can see that the, mainly they are in the Amazon area. Um, but not exclusively, so they can be found a bit south as well. And what about leopards? Leopards, uh, black leopards are about 11%, so more or less uh, same kind of proportion of the total global population. But in uh, black leopards, you can see that there is a certain concentration, and I've circled this out specifically because um, as this is the topic today, uh, there is a very high concentration of uh, melanistic black leopards uh, in Malaysia and they also occur uh, in some certain parts of uh, India as well, uh, associated with um, the wetter uh, forests, uh, more humid tropical forests. Now I will go on to talk about leopards in general. Um, so please excuse me if you already know uh, a lot about them, but uh, I'll try to make it quick. So the leopard's uh, scientific name, Panthera pardus, was uh, first uh, used uh, in, by the father of taxonomy, uh, Carl von Linnaeus, in 1758. And here you can see the evolutionary history of the Panthera cats. Um, and you can see that the leopard's closest relative is actually the lion. Um, which they split off about 2.6 million years ago. And then um, tigers and snow leopards are also related um, in the same Panthera genus. But clouded leopards, interestingly, they are not um, related to the, not so closely related, related to Panthera cats, but are actually a distinct, more I would say more ancient uh, lineage that split out from this more than 4.6 million years uh, ago. And here we have a map of um, leopard subspecies and their distribution. Uh, currently, there are nine subspecies, although recently uh, some of them have been merged, but generally accepted that there are nine. And from the westmost, you can see that this uh, Panthera pardus, pardus, which is the African leopard. So just let me backtrack a little. So what is a subspecies? Subspecies are just the same species of animal, but with uh, different geographical ranges. And they are usually distinctive in terms of uh, physical appearance, but not enough to make them a different species. So kind of like different races, um, if I can make this analogy. So the African leopard is uh, represented uh, by is the nominate subspecies. So therefore, the third 
word in the scientific name is Panthera pardus pardus. And then the other subspecies, the last, the third name would be uh, different. So for example, the next one you can see um, the Arabian leopard is uh, PP Nimir, N-I-M-R. Uh, that's the subspecies for Arabian leopard. And then on top, there's the Persian leopard, which is a uh, sexy color. And then we have the Indian leopard, Fosca, the Sri Lankan, Kotia, the uh, Javan leopard, which is uh, found only in Java, uh, Panthera pardus minelis, the uh, Amur leopard on the top right corner, which is Orientalis, a highly endangered subspecies, uh, the North China leopard, which is Japonensis, and then we have the Southeast Asian leopard, which uh, I will focus on today, um, Panthera pardus delacuri. Here we can see the leopard's uh, historic and current range. So previously on that map, you saw that uh, they, they are spread from Africa all the way east to Asia. But that might give you a false impression that they are found everywhere throughout the, the entire range, which is certainly not the case today. Um, this map here shows you the current extent of their leopard distribution, which is the, uh, the red parts basically. So you can see it's Outside of Africa, it is pretty much fragmented because of the uh, loss of habitat and persecution. So other than Africa, which is like a stronghold of leopards, um, but it is still quite fragmented. There's uh, some yellow areas which are lost. And uh, India, which is also a, a big area, um, you can see that the rest of the leopard distribution, especially let's say China, it's very, very patchy and it's really remnants. And uh, on the left, you see quite nicely uh, depicted the different photos of the subspecies. And at a glance, you probably will not be able to see much difference, but um, a lot of um, researchers who have studied them over the years uh, do have, uh, can do recognize the different uh, races. And for example, uh, let's say the Amir leopard, um, which is found in uh, northerly climates, uh, snowy conditions have a, a thicker coat than let's say the Arabian leopard, which is found in obviously very dry and hot conditions, which have very short coat and very pale, and it's actually the smallest subspecies. And what is the global population, you might ask? Well, interestingly, not all the subspecies uh, have been studied that closely in terms of population. So a good example is that in Africa, nobody has a clear idea. Um, people say that there are several hundred thousand uh, individuals, but it's not really a reliable estimate. And India, about 14,000. And outside of these two countries, we, we are really talking about a thousand individuals of each race. And as I mentioned previously, Amir leopard is the most, is the most endangered with uh, 60 to 100. And then the Arabian also uh, at less than a hundred. And um, leopard ecology, um, I'll also go through quickly uh, just some basic facts about their biology. So leopards are considered a medium-sized cat, um, nowhere near as large as tigers and lions, uh, about a quarter of their size. Uh, high sexual dimorphism basically means that uh, males are different size uh, on average than females. They are uh, could be 30 to 50% larger in size. And I mentioned also previously the different races are uh, different average sizes. So the smallest will be Arabian leopards and the largest contenders for largest, uh, there are a few. So some say Sri Lankan, some say Persian leopards and there are also records of very large uh, African leopards from South Africa. So these are individuals uh, approaching the maximum about 90 kilo, uh, kilograms for males. And they can be found in a very wide uh, variety of habitats. So leopards, are, as you can see, the range is huge, like almost worldwide except for the Americas. And they, therefore they can be found in all kinds of habitat and they are very adaptable uh, species. 
uh, home range, which is basically the territory size, um, is highly variable as well. So anywhere from uh, 10 to thousands of uh, square kilometers. And it really depends on the resources available, um, the pool resources for females and the number of females uh, in the territory for males. So the average is about 20 to 90 square kilometers. And in terms of diet, uh, leopards are known to be uh, very uh, versatile and adaptable as well. And there are over 200 known documented prey species, out of which uh, more than 100 are mammals of uh, medium to large size. So basically, whatever they can catch, um, they can survive on it. And you know, given the very broad habitat and diet requirements, therefore they are able to uh, spread out uh, throughout the world where, there, where there's uh, available habitat. Um, preferred prey size, there was a study that came out um, that examined this uh, criteria and it was found that 10 to 40 kilograms um, is the preferred, uh, usual, most common uh, prey size for leopards. So these are the smaller hooked animals like antelope, uh, deer, uh, pigs. Um, but obviously, given the known number of prey species, they can they can prey on anything from you know insects, uh, rodents to 900 kilo, uh, kilogram uh, antelopes like the eland from Africa. So, but obviously these are very uh, rare. And in terms of life history, sexual maturity is about two years. Um, gestation, which means uh, the pregnancy period, is about 90 to 100 days. So not very long given uh, the duration for an animal of this size, but it's quite typical for cats because they cannot afford to have uh, too long a pregnancy. And then the litter size, one to three cups, and lifespan, uh, 15 to 20 years. So here I'm going to show you some examples of uh, leopards on the hunt. And I think they are really amazing. So usually the leopards are the um, epitome of stealth, right? And they are able to creep within very close range of the prey before launching the attack. So generally about five to six meters for any successful uh, attack. But less than 10% of the hunts are end in a uh, kill. This is quite typical for predators. I mean, um, large cats in general. A uh, tiger has the same kind of uh, success rate. And this means that they kill on average about a deer-sized prey every 10 days or about 30 to 40 per year for one adult leopard. So here I have uh, two videos for you. This is the first. So somewhere in this scenery is a leopard and you it probably can't really tell where it is unless you really scrutinize. I hope you got that and you didn't blink because it just happens in a split second. And here's a slow motion of what happened. There we go. Amazing coordination, amazing timing. Here we have the second video. Oh, the leopard just launches the attack from the tree. Eating. Amazing. Just dropping in on the herd of impala feeding below. And now I'll move on to leopards in Southeast Asia. Um, and we can see that from this map, they are really a very imperial subspecies. So the red color is the total range that uh, they used to have um, until recently. And this is the Indo-Chinese leopard, Panthera pardus de la Curie, first named in 1930 by a naturalist called um, Pocock. And currently they have less than 5% of the historic range in red and limited to um, small patches in Cambodia, in uh, Myanmar, 
Thailand and of course Peninsular Malaysia, which I will talk about more. And estimated fewer than a thousand individuals in the wild. This is from a 2019 estimate. And currently the status is critically endangered uh, by IUCN. So here we have a picture of a non-melanistic Indo-Chinese leopard. And the characteristic is that the rosette pattern is actually quite large. Uh, and more spaced out compared to other subspecies like African leopards. So leopards in Peninsular Malaysia, um, this is an extract from the red list of mammals for Malaysia in 2017. And the dark green parts are the parts where they are quite certain that the currently leopards are found, where leopards are found, whereas the lighter green are possible areas and the lightest will be like the previous, the most earliest estimate. So we can see that um, it's main, they are mainly found in the protected areas of uh, Peninsular Malaysia. So uh, places like Taman Negara in the center, the big patch, um, Balloon, Royal Balloon uh, Park in the north, and Endar Rompin, the smallest uh, one uh, up down in uh, Johor and Pahang. And the area occupancy has uh, halved since 1980. So the dark green is, I mean, the area has strength to approximately about 40,000 square kilometers. And locally, the status is uh, endangered and they are totally protected species. So no hunting of any sort is allowed. Uh, no, no permits will be given for, for harvesting. And previously, I mentioned that the, uh, there was a study about the leopards in Malaysia using infrared cameras and they arrived at a density of about 3 per 100 square kilometers in Tringanu. So kind of using this uh, average estimate and if you just take the whole area 40,000 square kilometers, my estimate of the population will be around six to 800 individuals and um, this was found in uh, an article I published uh, back in 2019. And the ecology of uh, leopards in Peninsula Malaysia, I'll just briefly touch on this. So what do they eat? So actually there are very, I would say there are almost no studies on, on um, leopard ecology in, in Malaysia, uh, simply because of, uh, I guess, the, the very difficult terrain, very dense uh, forest and lack of funding. But historically, naturalists have documented uh, things that uh, black leopards have fed on. And these are the animals that you see here. Uh, wild boar, uh, mouse deer, monkeys, uh, even domestic animals like uh, goats, uh, chickens, dogs. So as uh, mentioned previously, small to medium sized uh, animals are the favorite prey. And what about the activity of uh, leopards in Malaysia? When are they most active? So here we have a study from um, Tringanu again, um, back in 2006. And you can see the activity pattern depicted here. Um, the middle part is uh, daytime and then the ends are the night. So you can see that uh, they are more nocturnal no, oh, sorry, I mean more diurnal, which is uh, active in the day than night, which is, I think, something most people wouldn't expect because you would think that, oh, you know, like the big cats, you know, they, they will just operate at night um, just for maximum efficiency but or hiding from humans. But this is not the case, which is uh, turned out to be a bit of a surprise. And what is the habitat preference? So, well, Malaysia, I mean, pretty uniform habitat, right? It's like rainforest. Um, but there's some studies that found that uh, it determined from the camera traps that they are found further from settlements, um, and but ne are nearer to streams or, and flat terrain. And they can be found in all kinds of uh, forests, basically, uh, not only just the big protected areas that I mentioned previously, but even urban forests, uh, small patches, uh, even near Kuala Lumpur, like Ayah Hitam Forest Reserve, for example, which is only 12 square kilometers, um, there's evidence of uh, a couple of leopards. So this is uh, quite amazing. 
So locally, black leopards in Malaysia, I mean Malay, Malay name is Harimau Kumbang, which literally translates to tiger beetle. So the reason why it's a beetle, I mean, beetles, I guess they are black. A lot of beetles are black and, you know, so the name Kumbang it just refers to the black tiger or something like that. Whereas the normal pattern uh, leopard is called Harimau Bintang, which I, if I'm not wrong. So Bintang means star, right? So because of the rosette and coat pattern, it's called Harimau Bintang, but black leopards are Harimau Kumba. And the most surprising fact is that um, most or almost all leopards found in Peninsula Malaysia are black. So this is called like fixation or melanism, and there was a study in um, about 10 years ago that uh, Dr. Kawanishi has uh, published that uh, she documented all the leopards in her study area um, somewhere in Tama, uh, Taman Negara, like all of them are black. So this was something that people have observed for a long time since colonial times. You can see the painting of the leopard. This was from 19th century. It's uh, from uh, William Farquhar's uh, natural history drawing collection. And this uh, is was probably painted by one of his uh, employees uh, from an individual in his menagerie back in Malacca, I believe. So they are black and people have known a long time, but this is the, the recently, only recently has it been scientifically uh, published. And um, across 17 sites in Peninsula Malaysia, uh, in this study, um, only two sites have uh, normal uh, non melanistic leopards. These are in uh, Ulumuda, which is uh, near the Thai border in Kedah. And surprisingly, in Endau Rompin, um, Johor, which is uh, a, quite an anomaly, but nobody knows why there was one individual that was captured on camera. But basically, almost 99% of all leopards are black. So what are the possible reasons for this um, really interesting phenomenon of all black leopards? So that are uh, two um, scientific uh, explanations as possible. One is it's just a random effect, right? Like um, from something called genetic drift. So what I have uh, the diagram here tries to show is the how genetic drift operates. Basically, it's a random selection. So if you can imagine the blue marbles in the jar being black individuals and the red ones non-black individuals. So over time in successive generations, because of the lack of gene flow from other areas, um, it could just be a random thing that there are more and more black leopards such that the normal ones are completely uh, gone after a few generations. So scientists have uh, kind of estimated that this is possible for Peninsula Malaysia and in as little as uh, 1,000 years, um, successive generations of leopards have become more and more melanistic until the entire population is just black. And if you remember from the inheritance of melanism that I talked about earlier, from recessive uh, inter inheritance, all the black leopards have a double recessive uh, mel melanistic gene. So any offspring by black leopards, two black parents are bound to be black. So it's 100% certainty that all the cubs will be black. So but then there was an interesting study uh, in 2014 where um, the genomes of uh, different uh, big uh, cat species uh, have been sequenced and the scientists actually found that there's a uh, little difference between uh, Indo-Chinese Indo leopards in Malaysia and rest of Southeast Asia like in Thailand and uh, Cambodia, places like that. So this is an interesting result because for the other species that they studied, like, like for the tiger, as, as you know, Malayan tigers are different subspecies. So they found enough uh, genetic differences between tigers in Malaysia and rest of Southeast Asia to make the Malaysian ones a different subspecies. And I believe there's uh, also differences for other cats like um, maybe golden cat, um, marble cat. But surprisingly for leopards, that that there's not much difference. So this just points to the fact that there was continued flow of genes and exchange of individuals between Malaysia and the rest of Southeast Asia. So if that's the case, then it kind of uh, 
throws a spanner in this explanation of genetic drift, but uh, more about that uh, later. And the second reason that could be possible for all black leopards is actually natural selection. So natural selection operates, um, I mean, if you know the basics of evolution, so something that is um, advantageous will be inherited um, by the offspring of the individual. So how is melanism advantageous for, for cats? Um, and this will be something that uh, I will, will postulate uh, subsequently. So there's a few reasons given here. Um, it's, it's actually um, even established that it was a, it's a phenomenon that individuals nearer the equator for all kinds of animal species, not just uh, leopards and panthers. So it's called Gogas rule, right? So the nearer we go to, towards the equator, more and more individuals become darker. So it can be found in like birds, reptiles, mammals. And some of the reasons were because there's a higher immunity against infectious diseases for darker individuals. Um, this is advantageous because in a tropical wet environment, um, disease transmission can be quite uh, a problem and uh, quite prevalent. So darker individuals may confer higher immunity. This is a kind of a reason. And of course, um, people also say that, you know, it's a just being dark, you can conceal yourself better in the rainforest, which is dark. So this will make it uh, make hunting for prey easier. But uh, is there something more to this? So in the previous slide, I talked about how melanism is advantageous um, being in a rainforest. But well, if that's the case, so why are black panthers not common in all rainforests? As you can see. For jaguars, uh, melanistic jaguars are found in the rainforest as well, but they are nowhere near as highly concentrated as the black leopards of uh, Peninsular Malaysia. And in Central and West Africa, uh, Congo forests, there are actually no confirmed record of any uh, black leopards, um, despite it being a rainforest environment as well. So this is um, quite an interesting observation that um, just because it's a rainforest doesn't mean that uh, black leopards will have to will be found there. And also other perceived advantages of melanism could be only weakly selective. Um, so what I mean by that is that you know there's no really a great advantage to being black um, even in a rainforest. So if that's the case then um, this makes it uh, the reason why melanism is not so widespread among other rainforest cat species as well. And here you can see uh, the, the picture on the bottom left. Um, this is an individual from, I believe it was uh, Gabon in uh, West Africa. So a place where there are no black leopards despite being it covered in a tropical rainforest. And the other two species here, I mean, clouded leopard is the bottom right. And on top of that is the ocelot of South and Central America. So interestingly, in these two rainforest cat species, there are also no documentation of melanism or black individuals. Then what are the some of the possible disadvantages of melanism? Um, and I've talked about how um, recessive allele, recessive mechanism uh, is less likely to be passed on um, compared to dominant. So it takes uh, the double inheritance of recessive uh, trait from both parents to result in melanism compared to just one uh, dominant allele from for the dominant uh, kind of inheritance. And also, um, people have found that black leopards have actually a smaller litter size on average, so a lower reproductive rate compared to normal uh, spotted leopards. And Recently, in 2019, there was a paper that came out to say that um, being a melanistic in cats uh, could be a source of potential issues in communication. So you can see that uh, in leopards and as well as tigers, right, behind the ears, there are two white patches. And this is believed to be a form of uh, communication for cubs to follow the, the parent through a dense underbrush. So obviously in melanistic 
uh, black leopards or any other black cat, this will be absent and there might be a, a disadvantageous um, consequences for this. If rainforests are not the only explanation for the concentration of melanistic leopards in Malaysia, what other factors could be at play? Let's take a look at the role of competition among carnivores. In peninsular Malaysia, there are seven species of wildcats, ranging in size from tigers to leopard cats, which are the size of domestic cats, as shown in the figure on the right. There are also 11 civet species, one marten, a weasel, and a couple of mongoose species, though these smaller carnivores do not compete as directly with leopards. Size matters here, and tigers are known to displace leopards from favorable habitats in places like India and Nepal. To minimize confrontation with larger, more dominant species, there are three strategies that may be adopted, but are they effective in Malaysia? Tigers prefer larger prey like samba deer and gaur, a large wild cattle weighing up to half a ton. These are however not as abundant in Malaysia, and therefore there is a higher overlap in diet between tigers and leopards. Second, data collected has shown little evidence of avoidance in timing of activity between the two cats. And lastly, avoiding the same habitat type is also a limited strategy in the uniform, dense forests of Malaysia, even though leopards are more arboreal compared to tigers. And this brings me to um, the slide where I will postulate why um, black leopards are prevalent in Malaysia. And here we have, uh, we need, I would say that we need two conditions. The first is a tropical evergreen rainforest environment. Um, this means that there needs to be a shady understory created by a closed canopy and low light levels even during the daytime. And this, this condition, as we have seen, you know, melanism is usually associated with uh, wetter areas, and this is a basic condition. Um, and this is not present in most of India and Nepal, so therefore we, we don't see that many black leopards in these areas. And secondly, something that most people will not realize, I mean, we also need the second condition, which is presence of a larger, more dominant competitor, and basically presence of tigers. Because being black makes it more, makes a bigger difference for consumers in the day than at night. Because at night, everything is black, right? So even if you are not black, it doesn't really make much of a difference. But in the day, in the low light level environment, being black, you can be concealed in the shade. And I believe this is like an evolutionary response to avoid uh, tigers and to share the environment with tigers. So this presence of a competitor is absent in Africa. So as I was saying earlier, there are no black leopards in the African rainforest, simply because leopards are already the apex predator in those environments. And there's basically no need to hide from any competitor there. They are dominant. And it's also absent in the neotropics for jaguars, which obviously jaguars are the apex predator throughout the whole of the South America. So therefore, there's no real driver to, to make uh, melanism so advantageous for the jaguars. So therefore, they are not as prevalent. So the combination of these two conditions, and this is found in Peninsular Malaysia. So Peninsular Malaysia both the habitat fulfills the condition and presence of tigers. So I believe it's the combination of these two that results in natural selection making it advantageous for leopards to be melanistic. And now moving on to black panthers of Singapore. And this is something I have written about previously in um, Nature Watch for, for Nature Society Singapore in an article. Um, a couple of years ago. Uh, this is something that most many people may not be aware of, um, that leopards were actually found in Singapore. I mean, we are at the southern tip of the Malay Peninsula, so it's 
to a certain extent, it's not surprising that we had these um, big cats in the past. It's just that um, it's always overshadowed by tigers, right? Because everybody knows that you know, tigers were a huge menace uh, during the 19th century, the early days of uh, colonization. But there are also leopards around, and you can see, you know, I compiled uh, a list of uh, leopard reports in the newspapers um, in this uh, table here. And there are certainly leopard sightings uh, throughout the 19th century, going on to the early 20th century as well. But I have to say that um, one disclaimer is that um, many, in many cases, the origin is unknown because they may come from captivity, they may come from the wildlife trade. I mean, Singapore is well known to be a major wildlife trade hub uh, in the early 20th century, um, 19th century onwards. So the middle picture, you can see there's a leopard, and this is, I think, um, a scene from Rochor area, which was a major area for wildlife trade in the past. And the picture on the right is um, none other than Henry Ridley, the first director of the Botanic Gardens, and the man who brought, basically brought uh, rubber cultivation to Malaysia. And in his hands, in his arms, he has a baby black panther, and this is taken in the Botanic Gardens. So one of the last uh, sightings of black leopards was from uh, the offshore island of Pulau Tekong in the early 1990s. So if you had followed the Nature Society's publications, uh, they had a newsletter called Pangolin um, up to the 1990s. And in it, they say that uh, there were reports of uh, possible black panther sightings by army personnel in Pulau Tekong. But unfortunately, no photos, no documentation. And since the 1970s, leopards are considered officially extinct. But the lack of reports was from as early as 1950, so I would say they could have been gone as early as 1950s. Uh, and interestingly, um, planters also made the headlines in the 1970s, but as escapees. So there was a huge, uh, quite uh, dramatic uh, incident in 1973, uh, just before the zoo opened, uh, a leopard has actually escaped and was wandering around the island in the central catchment area for almost a year, an entire year. And you can see the picture here, the police were deployed in a massive uh, manhunt uh, for this leopard, but they couldn't find it for months and until tragically in uh, 19, early 1974, he managed to corner this individual, uh, I believe it was uh, a drain at the turf club. And tragically, they threw some flares inside in order to try to drive the animal out, but the animal died. And this was uh, big news uh, back then. And there was even a postal stamp commemorating black leopards uh, from the Singapore Zoo. And yeah, this was a big case. And subsequently, there was, uh, I think 1974, there was a, another case of a black leopard escapee, but um, not as long, but also quite dramatic. And they eventually uh, also managed to find the escapee. And this was on a, a, a boat. But this time, fortunately, they didn't kill the animal, but managed to tranquilize it and brought it to the zoo. So lastly, my talk will be about Black Panthers uh, today in Malaysia. And so I'll start with a uh, human animal conflict. So these are quite uh, jarring images you may see here. In Malaysia today, there are still black leopards, of course. And they often appear in the news as uh, roadkill incidents, you know, uh, human animal conflict. The one in the middle was uh, unfortunately uh, hacked to death by some person who was attacked by this individual, but who happened to have a parang with him and fended off this leopard, but unfortunately the leopard didn't survive. And on the right side, you see uh, quite commonly also uh, livestock raiding. Uh, leopards will attack unprotected domestic animals like sheep. And once they get into a sheep pen, they will go on a queuing spree, but this is not out of uh, vindictiveness because it's, it's, a, it's kind of like a natural instinct for 
for the, for creditors to just keep on killing it's like this it's like a loop in the hardwire into their behavior uh, because they it's just taking advantage of the opportunity because they don't know when the next meal is coming from so if there's an opportunity to kill easily they'll just keep doing it and it's called surplus killing and then they'll just they won't stop until everything's dead so it's quite tragic for the for the farmer or the livestock keeper obviously but it, it happens And what happens to these so-called conflict animals? Um, basically, it's handled by the uh, Department of Wildlife for the and the conflict animals are tracked over a number of days using cages. And once the animal is trapped and they're tranquilized, then they will take health check measurements and I believe they might have even microchip the animal to see whether they, they you know, yeah, in future, if they ever capture the same individual, they will also know. And then lastly, they will be released away from where they were caught, further away from the settlements. But is this an ideal way of handling the situation? So here I show you some publications from India where leopard human conflict uh, is quite a big issue. And what the studies have found is that translocation of conflict animals, or translocation meaning like, you know, what I've just mentioned, taking an animal, trapping an animal, and then moving it away into a, a different place, uh, far from where it was found. So translocation will lead to actually increase in conflict, not decrease. And why is this so? Is is because the individuals they are introduced into unfamiliar areas, uh, it comes stress. You know, as you know. Big cats like these, they have home ranges, they have territories which they are familiar with uh, for years. And then once you put them in, a, in an alien place, foreign to them, they don't know anything about the area. They don't know where, where the prey is. They don't know where to get water. They don't know where to get shelter. They become stressed. And they might even encounter existing uh, other individuals of the uh, same species and might result in uh, negative uh, confrontation. And so they try to return to the, where they were from. They tried to come, go back to where they were taken, even though it might be dozens of kilometers away. So the study has found that um, there's actually an increase in conflict, as I mentioned earlier. So you can see from the chart, right? The, once the translocation campaign be, began, this is somewhere, this is, I believe, in uh, the state of Maharashtra, or uh, some uh, near Mumbai. And Conflicts actually increase after translocation. So what were the recommendations from uh, uh, Indian wildlife researchers? So education and awareness is very important, uh, obviously, like uh, to know that leopards are around and how to, you know, how to behave uh, to order, in order not to expose yourself, like walking in groups at night, making noises, things like that. And of course, proper livestock protection um, to secure your your livestock, like goats, overnight especially, um, so that they are not exposed to or draw the predators in. And lastly, to reduce the feral animals that may attract leopards. So, if you have like garbage dumps where we attract uh, things like rats, things like dogs, uh, wild pig, even uh, monkeys, and all these animals are prey for leopards and it will just attract the animal to the area. And so, my like, one of the last few slides that I have, conservation of the Malayan leopard. And I believe having introduced you to Malayan leopards and how uh, interesting a phenomenon that they are all melanistic. And therefore, there's, there's no such uh, population anywhere else in the world. It's the concentration of Black leopards, so it's really a globally unique uh, natural heritage worthy of uh, protection. And today they are threatened by poaching, they are threatened by habitat com conversion, like many wild animals, tigers included. Uh, but unfortunately, they are under the radar, I would say, because uh, there's just uh, people are not so aware of uh, panthers as, as say, for tigers, for example, which are getting all the attention. Although rightfully so, I mean, tigers, there are less than 150 individuals in the world today. They are really in a critical status and 
by all means, you know, funds should be allocated, manpower should be more, uh, mobilized to protect them. But I'm just saying, you know, like leopards, they are kind of like under the radar. But if we can protect tigers, I believe you can also, leopards will benefit from the same kind of protection and people chain work. And one of the organizations that have actually done this is uh, Rimba's uh, Harimau Salamanya project. Uh, Rimba is an NGO in, based in Trengganu, and it worked. It, it kind of uh, did this from the period 2014 20, 2020. They operate in the area called uh, Lake Kenway, and they did patrolling there, and then they managed to get the state authority to protect uh, quite a big area. And the focus, as you can see from this picture, they, they did focus on the larger cats, tigers, leopards, and colored leopards. Uh, however, now, post-2020, they have uh, moved this operation to Pantera, Malaysia. Pantera is an international NGO that uh, specializes in wildcat protection of all wildcat species. And the Malaysian branch actually took over Rimba's work in uh, Malaysia doing the anti-poaching patrol. So these two organizations are some example of uh, how this model can be applied in Malaysia. And I really hope that uh, there are same kinds of work being done elsewhere where leopards exist. Uh, in Andal Romping, for example, WCS uh, is in charge there. And also in uh, Royal Balloon National Park in the north, where the state authorities are doing a great job um, increasing patrolling methods. And now I'd like to end my talk by showing you this mini documentary from a group called Lea Lea. It's actually very excellent footage from them and I'll just leave you to enjoy it. Di hutan semenanjung Malaysia yang padat, terdapat seekor haiwan yang penuh misteri. Tersembunyi di sebalik rimbunan pokok-pokok gergasi ialah harimau kumbang. Ia mudah menyesuaikan diri untuk hidup di pelbagai jenis habitat. Harimau kumbang bukanlah spesies yang tersendiri, tetapi ia merupakan sejenis harimau bintang yang mempunyai melanin berlebihan. Disebabkan kadar pigmentasi gelap yang tinggi, harimau kumbang mempunyai bulu berwarna hitam sepenuhnya. Walaupun secara fizikalnya, Harimau bintang dan harimau kumbang kelihatan berbeza. Ia tidak mempunyai perbezaan genetik dan dianggap sebagai spesies yang sama. Tahukah anda, tidak seperti di tempat lain, populasi harimau bintang di hutan semenanjung Malaysia didominasi oleh harimau kumbang. Apabila malam menjelma, harimau kumbang yang berwarna hitam dapat berselindung sepenuhnya di sebalik kegelapan. Harimau kumbang mempunyai penglihatan yang tajam pada waktu malam. Tapak kakinya yang lebar membolehkannya untuk menghendap dan memburu mangsa dengan senyap di dalam gelap. Tahukah anda, harimau kumbang sebenarnya mempunyai corak berbintik-bintik di sebalik bulunya yang berwarna hitam. Kini, dengan teknologi perangkap kamera dan inframera, kita dapat melihat corak berbintik-bintik ini dengan lebih jelas. Setiap harimau kumbang mempunyai corak berbintik yang unik pada badannya. Harimau kumbang menghabiskan kebanyakan masanya berehat dan tidur di dahan pokok. Daripada ketinggian ini, ia dapat memerhatikan keadaan sekeliling serta merancang serangan ke atas mangsa ini. Disebabkan ciri-ciri ini, harimau kumbang dapat beradaptasi dengan gaya hidup arboreal dan ia antara spesies kucing besar yang banyak hidup di atas pokok. Harimau kumbang sering kelihatan bersendirian. Namun, ia akan kelihatan berpasangan semasa ia ingin membiak atau menjaga anaknya. Harimau kumbang mempunyai kawasan rayawan yang luas. 
dan ia akan mempertahankan kawasannya. Kebiasaannya, harimau kumbang akan menandakan kawasannya dengan semburan air kencing. Ini juga merupakan cara ia berkomunikasi dengan spesies kucing besar lain di sesebuah kawasan. Seperti kebanyakan spesies kucing besar lain, harimau kumbang diancam oleh penerbangan hutan dan aktiviti pembangunan oleh manusia. Pengurangan kawasan hutan ini mengancam habitat dan sumber makanannya. Harimau kumbang juga turut menjadi mangsa jerat yang dipasang oleh pemburu haram. Akibat jerat tersebut, Harimau kumbang berkaki tiga kini terdapat di hutan kita. Spesies kucing besar seperti harimau kumbang memainkan peranan penting dalam ekosistem kita dengan menyeimbangkan populasi haiwan-haiwan lain. Ia amat merugikan sekiranya kita kehilangan haiwan yang mengagumkan ini. Kita harus memastikan haiwan seperti harimau kumbang dapat terus hidup di hutan kita untuk kelangsungan alam segita demi generasi yang akan datang. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation this afternoon. And here I leave um, some links to the articles that I wrote about this, about Black Panthers, and you are welcome to check them out. One is in Malayan Nature Journal, where it's, most of my talk is based on this article in 2019. And also I mentioned the Black Panthers of Singapore article that I wrote for Nature Watch. And on the right, um, I have both a page uh, called Black Leopard in Facebook, as well as a group called Leopard the Open Cat. And if you scan the QR codes, the left one is for the Black Leopard page and the right one is for the Leopard group. So I welcome anyone to join uh, these two. And thank you again for listening and I welcome any questions you may have. Okay, thanks Ian for the amazing talk. Uh, we have a uh... I learned a lot. Okay, so basically, uh, Ian mentioned the Nature Watch, right? I actually have the copy with me here. Uh, this, okay, so basically, it is the June September 2019 issue. So you can Google Nature Watch, uh, other Nature Society Singapore, and you can just look for the June, June 2019 issue. And uh, the article that Ian wrote, uh, which is also very informative, you can be found there. Okay, so essentially, we we'll have some questions that are already in the uh, chat group. Okay, I'll just ask off the first question. Dingli will, uh, Dingli, are you still there? Yeah, very much you. indeed. Okay, that's great. Uh, Dingli will uh, select the next question to ask. Okay, so I'll just start off with the first question. Okay, so basically, um, talking about uh, melanism being linked to greater immunocompetence, which is greater uh, ability to fight off infectious diseases, right? Um, so is there a recent evidence of this? And uh, what? why is it? that uh, melanism is even linked to with uh, the Well, I think that's, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, that's, that's quite a technical one, I think. Um, I think this uh, idea of um, greater resistance to diseases is, is quite general. And as I was saying, I think it, it applies to all kinds of animals, not just mammals. Like I think they even say that in birds and reptiles, but I mean, you're right, because I, I don't think I've actually come across any um, like quantitative paper that actually tries to tries to have experiments on this. Um, but I suppose in, in the paper that I found, if I looked up the references, there, there might be there might be some references to actual studies that, that show that um, mel melanistic individuals have more resistance. But yeah, off, off my head, I, I don't have the reference with this before. Is there a reason why that melanism is linked to better resistance? 
I think it's just like a maybe it's like a co coexistence of uh, the same factor due to the gene mutation. So like the gene mutation for that causes this um, coloration difference uh, is also associated with another gene that confers the immunity. So it's like a correlation of the like you have this gene that means you also have that higher resistance. Not not that the gene for melanism itself is ben is beneficial in this yeah. way. Yeah, I think that's that's like the explanation. Okay. Okay, Dingli, you want to fill the next question? Okay, can I'll take a, I'll throw another question for Ian to consider. Yeah, thanks thanks for the other that that question. Yeah. Uh, by the way, Ian, maybe you want to share the MNS journal article in the chat so that some of the audience can download it is it possible to download it i think some people yeah. might be keen to read it yeah, yeah. um yeah. the question i would throw to you i'd like to bundle two questions together i think they're kind of linked and uh, this question comes from i think from timothy foot um he is asking about how uh leopards are faring in palm oil plantations in the in the region um do you think they are doing well in such plantations given that uh, we know that these plantations they have quite a number of uh you know wild pigs in them yeah and then i think there's another question coming from pam golden heart Al alchemy asking about how can we better you know advocate for the conservation of 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 leopards in southeast asia um what are your thoughts on these two conservation related questions um, okay, so the first question, thanks for the question, Tim. I think this applies to not just leopards, right? Because like tigers as well in Malaysia also um, prey predominantly on, on wild boar. And as we, as we know, wild boar, they like to eat the oil palm fruits. So there is certainly a um, higher prey abundance um, in, in terms of uh, wild boar and even monkeys in, in oil palm. But the problem with that is that um, it is is food. Uh, food is not the only factor that that um, drives the abundance of the predator. So they, they also need places for shelter. They also need um, water sources. So I would say like, well, you may have like a high abundance of prey, but if it's entirely oil palm with no other kind of vegetation, then there's really no place for for cats, uh, tigers, leopards, etc. There's no place for them to shelter. So interestingly. Um, there was a leopard cat study uh, done done in Singapore as well, and they showed that um, oil palm also has many rats, and then it actually led to a, an abundance of leopard cats. But as we all know, you know, leopard cats are much smaller, right? So it's um, maybe the habitat for shelter is not as critical. But yeah, I think um, it's it's kind of like a pro, pros and cons. So there's there are things that are being done to try to manage um, habitat within wildlife uh, within oil palm. Uh, excuse me. So oil palm plantation owners have been advised to, you know, retain some sort of um, natural vegetation somewhere in the midst, not just having a homogeneous plantation. So like things like having a stream with uh, vegetation will help as well. So for the second question, um, how do we, how do you contribute more or how do we help conservation for leopards? So it's quite general. So I, I pointed out some uh, NGOs that were doing work in, in Malaysia. So Panthera is based in New York and it's a huge organization that um, does uh, conservation for all cats. And they have a branch in uh, Malaysia. So I suppose if you contribute to Panthera, I mean, they, they have fundraising activities uh, quite frequently. So I would say uh, not just in Malaysia, they, they also have Panthera. Panthera also does research in Southeast Asia as well, in Indonesia, I think, and Thailand. So if you go to Panthera and then you go under the leopard, and then they will ex explain to you where 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 they are working. So I think this is a, might be a good uh, way to start as well. Okay. So okay, Wilma is asking: uh, Are there any records of uh, melanistic Asian golden cats in Malaysia? Well, um, not in Malaysia, I if I remember, but in Sumatra, yeah. So in Sumatra, um, there have been um, sightings. Not well, maybe not sighting, but maybe camera trap records. And also in the, um, I think in, in Northeast India, um, there was this study in, was it Bhutan or somewhere, some, somewhere in this kind of place, right, where 
they have shown like there were seven different colorations of golden cats. Golden cats are highly variable. So there were like spotted ones, there were gray ones, there were black ones, there were red ones. So there were, there were black ones were found there. Um, and interestingly, it was associated with um, higher altitude. So something that I, I should mention is that some of the smaller cats like serval even, um, the black serval you saw in the photo, like um, usually they are found in the higher altitude for some reason, perhaps due to the mountain vegetation being thicker than let's say in Africa, right? Africa in the lower part, you have, we have uh, hardly any trees, you know, open plains. And then when you go up, you have more forests. So maybe that's the reason. But Malaysia, yeah, I think from the study that I've seen, um, is the is the red coloration is the is the one that that's there. And occasionally you get the spotted ones. I think Endar Rompin has some, yeah. But black ones, I don't think so far, no, not really. Thanks. Thanks, Ian. Okay, maybe you'll ask the next question. Yeah, but, um, I did, well, the other, another question that caught me, I, I, I see that there's a, a comment coming in from uh, one of the, in relation to one of the previous questions on conservation. But anyway, let's take that uh, question that many uh, audiences in Singapore be interested in. I think there was a question about the status of the, um, the leopard in Singapore. Um, what is the what are the records of panthers in Singapore? And asking whether if what your thoughts are uh, about some of these uh, claim records of leopards from Ubin and Tekong Islands in the last 20, 30 years. Uh, do you have any thoughts on those purported records? Do you think they're genuine at all? Uh, I mean, they've been reported in some of these uh, publications. What, what are your th thoughts, Ian? Yeah, um, it's obviously it's very exciting, right, for people like like. We're living in Singapore, then we think that oh, yes, there could be tempers around. So I was mentioning the last one of the last sightings from Pulau Tekong that was in I think the early 1990s. I, it actually came out in like the newspaper. Um, but you know, if you if you follow the developments, um, Singapore, you know, we are developing so fast, and islands like Pulau Tekong, Pulau Ubin, even right. If you go today, and what you find in the North Shore facing Malaysia is an uh, entire unbroken barrier, a metal barrier erected to prevent uh, people from coming in. So that that defensive barrier, and then plus the fact that opposite uh, Pulau Tokong and Ubin today, you have uh, Johor that is very different today from what it was even in the 1990s, even as recently as that. So today, what we have in Johor there is just deforested and then there's nothing there's no forest there at the mouth of the Johor River uh, I mean if you drive there it's, it's quite a short drive and south of Bizarro you just see like there's a refinery there there are a lot of ships there and just today the fact that, that there's no place for leopards even in southern Johor I would say so the chances of one actually finding it is way down to Ubin and Tekong is I would say it's almost it's almost zero today unfortunately Although I would love to see leopards uh, coming here, but uh, sorry, but only I think only birds can fly to to the islands today. So definitely not leopards. Okay, okay. So there's a question about uh, the <clears throat> the Malayan uh, leopard being uh, more diurnal rather than nocturnal. So is it because it correlates with the because of the rain forage, uh, rainforest being more foliage? Uh, because of the density of plot foliage that it provides enough obscurity such that uh, nocturnal activity is not necessary. Is that the reason? Okay, so usually this was uh, this was found in one study, but I would say it, it, you cannot generalize with uh, big cats because, um, you know, leopards and tigers are very, very adaptable in terms of their behavior. So depending on the, the conditions there, um, they might be diurnal, or if there's a lot of human pressure, usually that's that's what causes them to become uh, nocturnal. So I would say, you know, by default, right, tigers and leopards usually they they operate anytime where the prey is active. So the things that they hunt, like wild boar, deer, um, you know, whenever they're active, that will be the time when the when the predators are active as well. So as for leopards, right, um, yeah. So I think that. Is because basically they are just following what the timing of their prey animal, which is quite similar to tiger. So it will just be around the day. So unless there's some reason that causes them to hide in the day, so I think that that is why they are more diurnal. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, 
Okay. Uh, it's also my own question. Um, so this diurnal behavior for leopards, is it true also in other parts of the world, other than Malaysia? Well, again, can't really generalize. I would say in most parts, unless uh, the there's really a high high human persecution, like let's say in some parts of Southeast Asia, right? Like maybe maybe in Cambodia, I think, um, or some parts of um, India, maybe even or uh, when there's a lot of um, um, villagers or, or people who are hunting them or who are present in the forest, where, wherever there's like high, it's not, not a protected area, you know, high human uh, habitation, these cats, these large cats will become nocturnal. But I think in general, if you go into a protected area, let's say Taman Nagara, deep in Taman Nagara, where, you know, there's really no, no um, human traffic. Um, these these cats will be operate in the day. Yeah, no problem. Um, okay, it's a very ignorant question, but basically, uh, why can't they hunt when their prey animal is inactive, as in when they are sleeping, or is it because they hide up so well that you can't really find them? The herd. Um, interesting question. I think uh, it's probably because when the prey animals are resting, right, they are, they are still, so, you know, as you know, cats are very visual animals, predators, right, they are using their eyesight most of the time, hearing. So when the animal, prey animal is not moving, there's no sound, there's no movement, so it cannot be, basically the detection is not, not easy. But yeah, so when they are moving around, then that's when they are being hunted. Okay, I understand. Okay, Ding Li, over to you. You can ask the next question. I'm, I'm not sure if there's uh, any questions that we have kind of not addressed, but I thought there was an interesting observation shared by one of our audiences from India about the co-occurrence of uh, tigers and leopards, uh, whereby in the case of India, there are quite good evidence to show that, you know, where you have tigers and leopards coming together, um, melanistic leopards seems to be the, the norm. And I think our our colleague also shared examples of these parks in India. I mean, just look through the list. I think there's a part, Hope, yeah, Kabini, Danelli, Tadoba. There are quite a number of parks having both uh, both uh, um, big cats. You have uh, melanistic leopards, yeah. And that also one brings me to a rather random point that, you know, for those of you who have read the uh, Rudyard Kipling's Jungle Book, you have a melanistic leopard in the storyline, uh, in the same forest that is also inhabited by tigers. So just, just making a comment and observation based on what one of our uh, colleagues have mentioned. Yeah, um, I think one of our uh, audience want to uh, hear a few more details about addressing land development. So maybe Ian can also have a look at that question. You know, I think, uh, let me just have a quick look at that question again. Um, there was a comment about, you know, um, how to deal with, uh, I think specifically, okay, how can we uh, help government communities and landowners to understand the importance of ecology before um, developing more land? So I think uh, our colleague would like to hear more uh, in insights from you, Ian, about how can we deal with uh, land use issues in, in, in Peninsula Malaysia, for example. So okay. over to you, Ian. Okay, well, um, two very different comments. So the first about you know observation of uh, yeah, but Bagheera, you know, Bagheera is a black panther in India. Well, you know the parks that you mentioned, right? Um, Kabini, um, Tadoba, yeah. Um, these there there are uh, black panthers there, and and they are they are the, they are quite famous because you know, India. I mean, it's a very open, more open terrain, and people have. Lots of people have gone there to, to photograph these black panthers, but you know, um, as you as I was saying in my presentation, there are black panthers in India, but the frequency is just not that high. So um, wherever wherever one appears, you know, it gets all the attention um, because they are so obvious compared to the others, uh, normal ones. So this this reinforces the point where that I'm trying to make is that. Um, you, you, did, you really need two conditions for, for more black panthers to be found compared to, to normal, non, uh, non melanistic individuals. Yeah, so these are a more open habitat. You know, occasionally you'll find one black panther, but you know, it's not, it's not, very, it's not a common thing. Um, 
So the second comment, well, this one is a um, is a is a complex issue, right? Because when you're talking about land use, you know, development, how do you bring this to the priority of governments? You know, this this is a tough one to crack. I mean, all conservationists are always thinking about this issue, and um, you know, one way people have tried to do it um, in recent years is to try to monetize you know, monetize uh, natural capital as, as a monetary value, like trying to put dollars into what the forest is worth, what biodiversity is worth, um, trying to balance that against uh, the use of development. So let's say if I clear this forest, uh, how much money will I get for the timber? You know, how much money will, will I get from growing oil palm or growing rubber on it? And then let's compare this with, you know, um, how much is the and how much are the animals there worth? You know, how much are the trees worth in terms of storing carbon? Um, I'm I, I mean um, I'm in a course today, uh, master's course, and you know, it's called na nature based climate solutions, and it is really the kind of trend today that um, scientists are trying to put a value on how much carbon can be stored, and hopefully using this in the context of uh, our climate change today, right, worsening conditions trying to put a big value on the standing forest and instead of chopping them down. So this is one avenue I would, I would say that uh, this is a, a way of dealing with a land, land use change. And of course, you know, protecting the standing forest benefits everything that stays that lives there. So it's kind of a tie-in with uh, conservation. So, you know, biodiversity crisis and climate change are, are, two, are really, you know, two sides of the same coin. So, you know, you help one, it benefits the other. Yeah, so I would say this is a, quite an obvious one. Okay. okay, I think there are no further questions, but I will ask uh, the last one on my, on my own. Okay, so basically, uh, I understand that for India, right, there are leopards that enter the city at night to, I don't know, to raid rubbish, uh, to hunt for dogs and all that. Are there any cases of it uh, happening in Malaysia, entering urban areas? Okay, so... Um... Yeah, interestingly, so I mentioned dogs as one of the prey items in, in that slide, right? So in Malaysia as well, I came across uh, more than one time, um, you know, a quote from from um, British um, expatriates that were here in the in the nineteenth century, early twentieth century, that they they do they do go for for dogs, you know, in the villages. Um, but I mean, recently, in more recent times, quite interestingly. Um, the, the slide on conflict, right? The, the more, more and more, there are more sightings. Um, I don't know whether it's because of COVID lockdown, but you know, there's more sightings of the leopards, black panthers being sighted quite near urban areas. Uh, and there was even recently, there was footage of one, you know, roaming from one house to another, you know, through the backyard and somebody videoed that uh, from the car. So like, you know, whether, what are they doing there? You know, um, Usually, you know, it's because of food or territory that they're out there. So, but are there documented cases of actually dogs today being taken? Uh, I think not that I've come across, but it, it is a real possibility. You know, as you know, as you know you're saying in India, you know, it happens uh, very often. And it's, yeah, so I wouldn't be surprised yeah, if, if it happens. In Mumbai, you can see them roaming yeah. around at night. Yeah. So feral dogs, they are, they are, they, are, they, they do attract them. But one one danger from that is that you know feral dogs harbor diseases that can cross over, like you know the recently there we had like tigers that were sick because of uh, having fat on the dogs, so this this could be a problem also like if, if it's if it spreads to leopards it's potentially quite fatal. Okay, uh, I think Ian is talking about the canine distemper disease. Right? Canine distemper virus. Right. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay, so I think there are no further questions. Thanks a lot for Ian for giving a very good talk and for everybody for. Uh, for being very good audiences. Okay, yeah, so uh, we'll end the session here. Okay, thank you.